Maria Nemeth's case is one of the many classic homicide cases rife in the United States. The country has a well-documented history of violence compared to other developed nations. It's astounding how many people continue to believe the United States facade as a saint's nest or God's own country. Instead, it's a place where deviant, violent cultures are encouraged through media, legislation, privilege, and freedom. This brings us to the sad and gory details of Maria Nemeth's Homicide. Welcome or welcome back to another episode of Twisted Minds. My name is James and it's time to play our game of Who Done It and Why. To her neighbors, Maria Nemeth was amongst the sweetest, kindest people they had ever met. She was well loved and had a great reputation. According to Dan Carter, Nemeth was very gentle, very private, soft-spoken young lady. We all loved her, very pleasant young lady. Another neighbor, Debbie Katz, also backed up this sentiment, who described the deceased as a very sweet, loving girl. Been here for years. I've been in and out of the office for eight years. Before her demise, Nemeth was employed as a leasing agent for an apartment complex. She met Fidel Lopez at a club during that time, and the two fell in love. Nemeth was a Peruvian native who moved to the United States in her teenage years, settling in Miami, Dade County, South Florida. She took up several jobs over the years, including office and retail gigs. Fidel Lopez, on the other hand, hails from Havana, Cuba. He left his hometown for the United States when he was only 15 or 16 to join his father, who was already in the country. At the time of his arrest, Lopez worked at the 595 truck stop on 2705 Burris Road, Davie, Florida. When the business was contacted, the manager stressed that Lopez was a temporary hire with a few days on his contract. Broward Court records revealed that Nemeth had left a marriage previously, which, unfortunately, was a factor in her death. In April 2007, she tied the knot with a man named Norbert in a religious ceremony held in Boca Raton. They were married for eight years before splitting up. However, they weren't officially divorced, merely separated. So, when news of Nemeth's death reached Norbert, he declined to comment, but implied that he or the deceased's family might make a statement eventually. Maria's new relationship with Lopez was only one year in when tragedy struck. At the time of their meeting, he had two kids and he was living with their mother. As the relationship grew over time and became more serious, Nemeth and Lopez decided to move in together. First, they found a place in Hollywood. Then, they relocated to Hialeah to put up with Lopez's family as they searched for a new place. In a twisted turn of fate, they found and paid for a place at Colonnade Residences in Sunrise. Nemeth was the leading manager of the apartment complex, so they easily moved in. Then, a week into their stay at the new place, Lopez returned home from the truck stop to Nemeth, who'd done some cooking. The couple had rice, chicken, and beans for dinner before driving up to Hialeah to meet and spend time with Fidel's mother. Lopez recounted that he took Nemeth to a Chili's restaurant the same night, where they ordered some margaritas before making another stop at ABC Fine Wine and Spirits. There, he got them a bottle of tequila, which they took back to their house in Sunrise. Since they were fairly new in the apartment, the couple hadn't got around to getting furniture, so they made a makeshift table using several cardboard boxes. The same night, they did some tequila shots, even cutting some limes and garnishing with salt. All the while, they blasted some music on a cell phone and down half the bottle. All seemed to be going well until it was not. Lopez caught a blinding rage that saw the sliding glass door and closet door torn down while the drywall took several punches that left holes in it. Lopez claimed that he was too stoned to remember what sent him on a hulking spree in the first place, but he did remember that he and Nemeth had had the roughest sex inside the closet. In their drunken haze, the couple wound up in the bathroom because Maria Nemeth felt nauseous. I just remembered seeing glass on the floor. I really don't remember when I broke it or why did I break it, Lopez reported to investigators. He claimed to have stepped out almost immediately for a smoke, but returned to find Nemeth barely breathing on the bathroom floor. A decent argument. If the deceased wasn't found with her vaginal canal sprawled out all over the floor. Oh with the intestines completely torn out of her body. Yeah, things are about to take a turn for the worst. It's 3.39 a.m. when the 911 line buzzes. An operator jumps on the call to hear a frightened Lopez whimpering at the other end of the line. She's not breathing. She's not breathing, he cried. She's gonna die. She's not breathing. Send the ambulance. Oh my God, oh my God. 
she was shrinking. And then, like, I don't know, I don't know when she went to the bathroom or when I went there. She was, it was full-blown and everything. Like, like, I don't know, man, she's not breathing. I mean, like, she's, she's gonna die, man. Come on, son. A couple minutes later, the Sunrise Police Department had flooded around the Colonnade residence. They made their way to the couple's apartment where they found Lopez wailing over Nemeth's nude body in the bathroom. Blood had puddled near the corpse and body tissue stretched from the deceased's nether region. A crying man rang 911 and a dead woman turned inside out seemed like something out of the illegal abortion handbook. Or so the detectives thought until they tried to get Lopez's statement. His account and the disarray of the apartment told a different story though. Blood stains were all over the apartment. Not just the bathroom, bedroom, closet, doors, and walls. The broken sliding glass and the door torn clean off its hinges further spurred suspicion of foul play. Some 30 minutes into their arrival, Nemeth was pronounced dead by the Sunrise Fire Rescue Department. Detectives searched for clues around the house and happened on the half-empty bottle of tequila that started the night and slices of lime and several indications of a scuffle. Upon reaching out to the neighbors, two claimed to have heard a lot of noise with a man yelling at the top of his voice for about two hours before all went quiet. Lopez was brought in for questioning the following day, a Sunday morning to recount his side of the story. He began by revealing their sex ramp in the closet before Nemeth made her way to the bathroom, where she was subsequently puking and collapsed. When asked about foreign objects in her body, Lopez clarified that Nemeth had talked him into trying beer bottles as an adult toy. Surely no woman in the history of sexual encounters has ever urged a guy to take out his phallus and instead stuff her with bottles? Well, let's just see how this holds up in court. Fortunately, the detectives didn't buy the story and pressed Lopez for more details. Instead, he finally caved and described in gory detail how he snapped and murdered his girlfriend of one year. All seemed to be going fine when they were making love until Nemeth made the murder-worthy error of calling out her ex-husband's name twice. Lopez flew into a rage. She changed my name, he told detectives. That's not really how the change of names works, but okay. She called me the name of the other guy, and she said it twice, and she was wrong, and she was confusing me with him. According to Lopez, he stepped out of the closet and began breaking things around the house. The rear sliding door was his first victim, followed by the drywall and the closet door, because, you know, the house is to blame. Upon returning to the closet, he found that Nemeth had collapsed and was unconscious. Horrifically, Lopez grabbed some beer bottles and began inserting them up Nemeth's vagina. Not looking quite as stuffed as he was hoping for, Lopez went ahead and added a flat iron for hair. Just to make sure everything was in the right place, he rammed both of his arms up there to his elbow, felt around for her intestines, grabbed and pulled them out. Lopez added that Nemeth didn't move while he rearranged her insides, and so he grew worried. So he fetched some water and splashed it on her face. Then, when she remained unconscious, he moved to the bathroom to wash off his bloodied hands before stepping out on the porch for some cigarettes. I was so nervous, man, he told investigators. I wasn't thinking, man. I wasn't thinking. Upon returning to the bathroom, Lopez found that Nemeth's corpse made for solid aesthetics. So, he grabbed some nearby items to cover up the tissue he'd yanked out. Finally, he checked to see if she was breathing again before calling the authorities. After confessing to how he violated Nemeth, Lopez tried to get some clues from the investigators. I know I'm going to jail, but I have two kids, you know. How many years do you think this is gonna cost me? By the afternoon of the same day, Fidel Lopez was arrested on the charge of first degree murder. He was held without bond, and there are no legal protests from his attorney. Records fail to indicate if he even hired one. Lopez's only other legal misconduct was for disorderly intoxication in 2014, as shown on the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. After meeting with his attorneys, Lopez was ready for his court appearance, and a Broward judge set February 13th, 2016, as the date for setting up the jury. Melissa McNeil, a defense lawyer, commented that the move for a speedy trial was made for only one reason, although it was waived more times than used. She ended by saying, we are ready for trial. Luckily for him, his timing for a speedy trial was beneficial to his case, which had two counts of sexual battery and first degree murder. So tabling the case to a jury as quickly as possible 
prevents the state from initiating the death penalty. Before now, Florida's strategy for using the death sentence was deemed unconstitutional and subjected to further verification processes. Within that time, Alona Holmes, a Broward Circuit judge, placed a formal inhibition on the state attorney's office from pursuing the death penalty. Tom Coleman from the prosecuting counsel declined to comment on the state's decision to appeal the ban. Jury selection began in earnest on the due date, and a time was set for the panel to return to court and hear the confession that Lopez had provided to the Sunrise Police Department. A week before Lopez's court appearance, the defense lawyers filed a motion arguing that he wasn't read his Miranda rights properly. Hence, he didn't understand his rights during the interrogation process. The defense also hoped to lower the amount and type of crime scene photos that the jury got to see for fear that the gruesome images may spark unnecessary outrage. This way the case would be decided based on sentiments instead of facts of the incident. The judges routinely compromised with Holmes choosing the photos of the crime scene that the jurors got to view. As for the speedy trial, Lopez was arraigned in a Broward courtroom on October 19th, 2015. He was brought in wearing handcuffs and striped jail clothes. His deposition was rather stoic for about an hour until Christopher Pagan, the attorney representing him, promptly pulled out of the case. Another Broward Circuit Court judge, Lisa Porter, filed for a new public defender to represent the accused. A not guilty plea has been entered on your behalf, Mr. Lopez, Porter remarked. It turned out that Pagan and other public defenders on his team, including Caroline McRae and Jose Reyes, had confided in Lopez about a change of representation before his arraignment. Lopez remained behind bars without bond until his next scheduled court hearing on December 10, 2015. This time he pleaded guilty to charges of sexual battery and murder of his 31-year-old girlfriend, Maria Nemeth, to a Broward County courtroom. Owning up to the crime was part of his plan with the prosecutors. The court was adjourned to August 3rd, 2016 for his official sentencing, where he would serve a life sentence with no parole instead of being served the death penalty. Gabe Ermine, a defense attorney, added that he tried negotiating a 50-year sentence but was completely shut down by the prosecutors. Mr. Lopez was very remorseful and, as evidenced by what he did today, he took full responsibility, accepts full responsibility, and decided to accept the plea, which is life, Ermine added. The life sentence deal was reached on Thursday but won't be an official sentence until August 3rd. Soon, it was the sentencing day. Maria Nemeth's uncle was allowed to read the family statement to the court hearing. He noted that only God could determine Lopez's fate. Afterward, Broward County Judge Ilona Holmes announced the sentence and officially closed the case. The conclusion for the terms of avoiding the death penalty was that he could neither appeal the sentence nor qualify for parole. Maria's father commented on his daughter's life through an interpreter upon the session's close. If I had to summarize the life of Maria, it would be very difficult to express it in just a few lines. I wanna tell you that she was and will continue to be a model of affection, effort, perseverance, and love of humanity, he said. Lopez was apologetic too and sought the forgiveness of Nemeth's family. He extended his gratitude to the judge for giving him a chance at life. Today. I'm happy to fulfill this conviction. I know what I did has to be paid for, and I agree. I will pay with my life for the life I took, he said. To Maria's family, I ask for forgiveness. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Fidel Lopez. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.